know, it, it would probably be advisable for us to get to know each other a little bit better prior to this evening. That's a capital idea. I'm afraid neither one of us were monitoring our designated entrance or exit. I'm not convinced that mutual predilection towards sesquipedalian oratory is in fact the greatest indicator of romantic compatibility. In fact, when delivered with such pernicious regularity, it can become extraordinarily cacophonous. But you gotta start somewhere in the 20th episode of the all-new Mighty Morphin Rangers. I'm already docking points from Power Rangers for not including an Oxford comma in their title. It's my show. I can do whatever I want. For example, in this pairing, it's all about kicking ass while wearing braids. And as you can see, I am all in for this. Last time, we were forced to jump ahead in Power Rangers land into the post Zhu Ranger Zhu 2 era of Season 1. That's because Barai was technically not in the episode. Well, forget technically, he's definitely not in this one, so now we're jumping back. This is another one of those Barai Zhu Ranger episodes that was adapted earlier in the season, before Tommy joins up. It's a standard romp where Billy falls in love with a nerd girl, Rita's monster kidnaps said nerd girl, and the Power Rangers have to save her. There's a dance at the youth center, Bulk falls into a cake, Ernie falls into a cake, it's all the usual stuff. This show does waste a lot of food, come to think of it. For Zhu Ranger, it's also a fairly typical episode. Since Barai is totally out of things, there is no ongoing storyline to deal with. It's back to a kid of the week who imprints on a Zhu Ranger like a baby bird. This time, Don. Bondora is trying to sacrifice children to make something terrible happen. The kid learns a lesson and helps defeat the monster. There's nothing wrong with any of this. It's a solid foundation, and Power Rangers adapts it in a reasonable way. One of these may surprise you, though. It definitely surprised me. Despite what I said, these episodes don't have that much in common at all, besides focusing on the same lead character and featuring the same monster. In fact, I think you'll notice my common refrain in this comparison is pointing out the episodes doing the exact opposite things in order to reach the same conclusion. For starters, the monsters are put to different purposes. I have no idea what this monster is supposed to be based on, or what its name references. One source claims it's the Dutch word for heron. Another source suggests it's the Japanese word for cold. The subtitles don't reflect either of those. Because of that, I'm going to leave her Zhu Ranger name as a straight romanization. Dora Rega kidnaps children, sacrificing them for a ritual that will flood the earth for a thousand days. Madam Wo is said to have certain weather-based powers, but never really does anything with them. I'm not even sure where she comes from. Sure, Rita opens the episode with reused footage telling her minions to make a monster. However, when we're first introduced to her by Rita calling out to Madam Wo, it's through footage of Dora Rega performing her ritual. That is to say, it's after she's more or less finished menacing the world at large. Since there's no real context for what she's doing or why she has props, it ends up looking like Madame Woe is just some being out there living her life, and Rita simply recruits her to stir up some trouble. I honestly don't know if she was created by Rita or is just friends with her. I think the latter would have been cool if they'd taken it that way, but as it is, the combination of footage makes it vague. In both shows, she's kind of a beast. She fights pretty hard. I was surprised to see how much Madame Woe beats up on Billy, and in a way that seems kind of torturous. The monster primarily fights with her awesomely long braids. Wrapping people up in them, throwing them around. I guess we've had several villains lately wrap characters up in appendages, but none seems as brutal as this one. And naturally, Power Rangers is only giving me half the story. How Dora Rega captures kids is terrifying. She wraps her plates around their necks to pull them into her pond, strangling them and seemingly drowning them. A little boy's sandal bubbles up afterwards. Obviously, they're all okay in the end, encased in a magic jar of liquid, but it's pretty creepy. It's right on that line, I think. Children are menaced in this show all the time, but this is just realistic enough that it legitimately comes across as frightening. We certainly don't see anything like this happen to Marge, Billy's girlfriend. Since she and Madame Woe can't directly interact, Marge just stands around in the background of their tiny set, 
frightened but otherwise unharmed. Power Rangers can't keep any of this, and they probably wouldn't even if they could. But remember last time when I said we'd gotten to the point where Billy has improved his fighting prowess? We're clearly not there right now. Just like with High Five, it's difficult to reconcile how squishy Billy turns into this fighting machine when the Japanese footage kicks in. But unlike High Five, at least this episode gives Billy a reason to go for broke. Were these differences embraced a bit more? This could be a great character development episode where Billy has to find his courage and ultimately become a more daring fighter. As we delve more deeply into a Jew Ranger counterpart, we'll see this would have been the perfect episode in which to do that. I'm not really interested in engaging feminine attention through bodily gyrations. There are no child sacrifices in Power Rangers, no plan to flood the Earth. Madame Woe can trap people in her realm, but no drowning them. When she captures all five Power Rangers the moment they leap into battle, I assumed there was going to be a lot of untransformed fight footage they had to cut. But no. Dora Rega gets the Zhu Rangers just as easily. The results are exactly the same, which is why I think it's funny that the villain's goals are the exact opposite. Nabbing the Zhu Rangers in this case is kind of a bonus prize for Bondora. Her goal is to get the children. Rita, by contrast, is livid that Madame Woe gets Marge by mistake. Why did you grab her? I wanted the Power Rangers! We can't have an early Power Rangers episode without a random power they pull out of their asses. Before the Rangers head off to battle, Zordon informs them that if they put their power coins together, one Ranger can combine the powers of the others. Or something like that. In actuality, it's used to get Billy out of Madame Woe's dimension. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm guessing there's something massive they cut out of Zhu Ranger, right? Actually, no. Somehow it's even worse there. There's none of the nonsense about stacking powers, but at least that's an explanation. In Zhu Ranger, using the medallions just happens, and we're supposed to accept it. It makes absolutely no sense in either show, but at least Power Rangers decided to give it the tiniest bit of setup. There's also a weird moment in Zhu Ranger after Don and the Kid of the Week are first taken to Dora Rega's realm. Don's headband falls into the water. I don't understand why. It sounds like a silly thing to bring up, but the episode makes a relatively big deal out of it. No one mentions it, but the camera calls attention to it, and Don is missing his signature headgear for the rest of the episode. Remember that the Zhu Rangers almost never even change their clothes, so any kind of costume change is noticeable. I thought it was going to tie into something, but no. He has it back in the last scene with no explanation at all. That's another common thread in these episodes, because Power Rangers has its own useless trinket. No, that's not fair. Marge's necklace is not useless. It's just overshadowed. See, Marge has a treasured necklace that her mother gave her. My mother gave it to me when I graduated from the Accelerated Baby Genius Program. Accelerated Baby Genius Program. Accelerated Baby Genius Program. Accelerated Baby Genius, Baby Genius Program. In their meet cute, Billy accidentally knocks it off and gets to put it back on her. It falls off again when she's kidnapped, cluing Billy into the fact that she did make it to the park. And at the end of the episode, once she is saved, Billy gets to give it back to her. So it is set up and paid off. It's just odd that Rita has to send down putties. She always has to do this. And sure, she's trying to capture the rangers. Doesn't send down Madame Woe to correct her mistake, which would have been a lot easier. But since the putties scream loud and clear that Rita is up to something, and Zordon confirms that Marge has been taken, the necklace ends up being kind of useless in terms of progressing the plot. Still, though, it punctuates the relationship, with its status symbolizing the relationship's status. While it would have been nice to successfully score both plot and character, one out of two is still better than the bandana. So that's two, albeit minor, elements in a row Power Rangers does better. It's funny, though, because I'm certain Marge's necklace is inspired by the necklace in Zhu Ranger, and that necklace couldn't be more important. Meet Saori. She's such a coward, her name actually sounds like Sorry, but she does have some awesomely long braids. She can't bring herself to stand up for her best friend Yuko when she's being bullied, forcing Don to step in. This causes a rift in their friendship, which is immediately rendered moot when Dora Rega abducts Yuko. She tries to take Don and Saori as well, 
But when Saori's necklace touches the water, something happens, and both of them are freed. Not even Dora Rega understands it, but Bondora knows. Back in prehistoric times, Bondora tried to capture two fairies, Sunny, the Sun Fairy, and Rainy, the Rain Fairy, by turning them into gems. And yeah, those are actually their names, Sunny and Rainy. They're in English, though, so it probably sounds more exotic to its intended audience. Unfortunately, Sunny was lost, but the Rainy gem is on Dora Rega's forehead and gives her her powers. The gem in Saori's necklace is Sunny, and the two gems can't come into contact with each other without disrupting Dora Rega. I have no idea how Saori has this gem, and the story never bothers to explain. Magical prehistoric gems aren't going to be in random costume jewelry you find at the Japanese equivalent of Claire's. Believe me, I've checked. But, you know, whatever. Also, Saori turns out to be the only person Sunny can speak to, and thus is instrumental in getting this same exposition to the Zhu Rangers. So, the guest character's signature accessory is necessary to defeat the monster. I just feel like it wouldn't have been too difficult for Power Rangers to do this. They already had all the elements in place. Since they don't, we once again get the same thing being accomplished through opposite means. In Power Rangers, their goal is to destroy the gem on Madame Woe's head. In Zhu Ranger, destroying the gem will kill Rainy, which is the last thing they want to do. Billy gets out of the Dark Dimension with the power of Aspol. He and Madame Woe fight for a while, and he finally destroys the gem in <laughs> what is very obviously footage original to Power Rangers. I don't want to make fun of this too much. It does the job. It's <laughs> very clearly a cobbled together mannequin, but it does the job. A kid's not going to notice. It made me wonder, though, what was happening in the original that necessitated this change? And that's where the episode surprised me, so strap in. Don gets out of the Dark Dimension with the power of Aspol. He has to find Saori, who has run off in fear now that the Zhu Rangers have been taken, despite Sunny begging her to go back. Don gives her a pep talk about finding her courage. Then Dora Rega finds them, and Don puts that courage to the test by telling Saori to... go... hide. Okay. This is starting to feel like stuff we've all seen before. Goshi had the cowardly boy who had to find the courage to be cut in half by a giant sword. Now that Saori has passed on her final exposition that the gems need to be brought together and told to hide, what else can she do? Yeah, the kids learned her lesson. We're just gonna wrap things up like every other episode and forget this kid ever ex- <laughs> This is the most badass thing I've ever seen in my entire life! As soon as Don loses the necklace, the episode goes full melodrama. Any subtlety is crushed as much as Don's spine is by this point. Saori spirals into a guilt montage, remembering how she failed Yuko, how Sunny and Rainy are likewise best friends who can never be together. She remembers Don's lesson and goes full Braveheart, becoming the coolest person I've ever seen in this show, and slamming that gym right into Dora Rega's face. It is absolutely amazing. I might be ruffling feathers by saying this, but I consider things like Power Rangers and Sentai to be... entertainment junk food. And that's fine. I've been analyzing Dragon Ball for ten years. Everyone enjoys a good bag of potato chips every once in a while. It's raucous fun, but not necessarily nourishing. I actually really felt something with this. It's so emotional, so inspiring, so exciting. So much better than that previous Courage episode could have hoped to be. It also explains why Dora Rega attacks Don so brutally. It has to be enough to motivate such a powerfully dramatic response. And you know what hit me the hardest? when she takes Don's advice. Don encourages Saori to spell out courage, wrap it up, and swallow it. It sounds silly, but it's also perfect. I'm no psychologist, but it seems like a great way for children to learn how to contextualize an abstract concept, to render it as something tangible, and to carry it out as a ritual that makes them feel empowered. So when Saori stands up and starts spelling you, u, ki, to coax herself into the dangerous thing she's about to do, I was surprised how much it affected me. 
Zhu Ranger's whole shtick is teaching a disposable kid a lesson. For the first time, I'm actually disappointed I'm never going to see this kid again. This is an episode I wish I could have seen as a child because I believe it would have inspired me. Just look at this again, this little girl in pigtails running through a fireball being the biggest damn hero in the world. In case you can't tell, I stand Saori, and all of you should too. I'm using that word correctly, aren't I? I think I am. For its few details it does better, this is where Power Rangers really loses it on the basis of comparison. Saori is a character who... let's just see it again. So cool. Saori is a character who has an arc. She's flawed and relatable, but ultimately heroic and brave. She learns from the example of Don and the fairies. Marge is nothing but a damsel in distress, and it really throws me when Japan features a more active and progressive female guest star than we do. Like I said, Power Rangers already has its own necklace that's begging to be something more. You don't want it to be prehistoric fairies? Fine. Billy and Marge were already going to perform an experiment together. Let them. Have Billy accidentally hit the necklace with some technobabble beam that causes it to react to Madame Woe's gym. You already had to reshoot the moment of impact. Put Marge in there. It'd be so easy to do a straight find and replace for Saori in the final fight. She and Don are rarely on screen together anyway, and it's such a great moment of teamwork. But alas, this advice I'm giving you is of no help, as this was 29 years ago, and you already dropped the ball. These are both good, standard episodes. Neither one is reaching for the stars, trying to be a big event episode, or push a momentous storyline. They are typical episodes of their respective shows. However, Teach Me the Jewel of Bravery excels at what a typical episode can be, takes a standard concept and elevates it through amazing execution. Peace, Love, and Woe sadly never rises above. And that's not a huge problem except when it's held up side by side with its progenitor. For story, it's gotta be Zhu Ranger. Power Rangers definitely picks up some slack by trying to fix the weird power coin issue, and its necklace makes more sense than Don's bandana. But as far as the core of the story goes, it's really no contest. It's practically no contest for characters either. I will say the only thing I remembered about this Power Rangers episode from my childhood is Bulk keeping Cash in his nasty foot. For some reason, that has always stuck with me. I don't know if that's a point in its favor or against it. Don's put in a good role here. If the show is going to arbitrarily decide he's the warrior of courage, the best thing they can do is run with it, which they do. Zhu Ranger's only failing in this regard is the simple fact that Sunny and Rainy annoy me. I could do without their ugly rear screen projection friendship and annoying pitched up chipmunk fairy voices. It certainly doesn't help that most of their dialogue is repeating the other's name. Then again, Marge kind of gets on my nerves too. But I'm not a Power Ranger! She just doesn't deliver her polysyllabic nonsense nearly as charmingly as Billy does, and putting both of them together for long stretches begins to grate as much as... well... <laughs> and as I hope I've made more than clear, Saori is just a much better character than Marge. Zhu Ranger wins. For action, I have to point out that Power Rangers changes the coup de grace entirely. The Zhu Rangers use their Ranger Slinger combination to defeat the monster. Since this episode of Power Rangers was produced for much earlier in the season, before the Rangers get those weapons, Peace, Love, and Woe switches that out for stock footage of their Power Blaster. It's a shame that the Thunderslingers are almost never seen in Power Rangers, but this understandable switch out doesn't negatively affect it. That it lacks this, though... What else can I say? Zhu Ranger wins. It's another clean sweep. When I started this series, I had so many people asking me if I was going to skip the filler episodes. It always kind of bristled me. These are hardly story-heavy series, and something doesn't have to be serialized to be worth watching. Episodic entries have the potential to be just as good. If nothing else, I hope this video helps illustrate that. I think this has become one of my favorite Zhu Ranger episodes. I thought I was going to do two pairings in this video, but I just had too much to say about this one. So, I've already watched the next pair, which in Zhu Ranger's case is very much connected to the overarching storyline, and let me go ahead and tell you, it ain't that good. It's certainly not as good as this. Storylines aren't everything. 
With that tantalizing tease thrown out there, I hope you join me next time. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you had fun. I certainly did. A special thanks to my wonderful patrons who fund videos like these. You are the best. I'll see you next time.